welcome to the first um the first event of our evening series my life my death and my choices and um, so this series aims to kind of explore what is advanced care planning and look at different aspects of that um, so just to correlate with the department of health policy that's um currently in the making so um tonight's session will focus on what is advanced care planning and how is it relevant um to you and how is it relevant to all of us so um will we start with introductions i don't know how many of you are familiar with the healthcare leadership forum but we are a multidisciplinary student group um from healthcare students in northern ireland so university of ulster queen's university um, open university um, any any sort of degree course that is doing like healthcare studies we are open and that's what our committee is made up of ideally our goal is to create like a lead mini multidisciplinary team and then we choose different issues that we feel are important to be looked at in healthcare and we bash out a conference or facilitate a discussion whatever we feel we can contribute to the changing and growing health service so this is our exciting project at the moment um, my name is sarah rutherford i am the chairperson of the committee and then joined with us tonight are karina nina dina d and michelle anything else and karen sorry karen <laughs> and then we've got all the background committee working in the background so thanks to them um karina do you want to start by introducing yourself? Yes, thank you. Good evening and thank you very much to the um, Northern Ireland Healthcare Leaderships Forum. We're uh, delighted to work in partnership for, for this event and, and some of the other across the series. Um, as you said, my name is Karina Grimes and currently working in the Department of Health. And along with my colleagues here, we're progressing a regional advanced care planning uh, policy for Northern Ireland. So thank you. Will I just go ahead, Sarah? Uh, Keen, Keen is mustard. Um, hello, everybody. And um, just to reiterate our thanks to the forum, Sarah, for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Derek McKenna. I'm a social worker by profession. So I feel a bit of a, you know, that I've snuck in uh, to something, um, but absolutely delighted uh, that I have. And my background is in palliative and end of life care, where I worked in the hospice in Uri and then in this. Southern Health and Social Care Trust as a, a specialist social worker in the multidisciplinary specialist palliative care team. And in October, on October 1st, I was seconded across to work with Karina and Karen and, and Michelle and, and two others to develop this advanced care planning policy. So really looking forward to this evening um, and yeah, excited to engage. Great to have you. Um, Michelle? Hello, uh, my name is Michelle Smith and I'm the project support officer working with the team. Uh, really excited to be here this evening. Thank you. Karen? Hello, my name is Karen Dawson. I work in the primary care directorate in the Department of Health and I'm on the project team for the advanced care planning policy and uh, really looking forward to tonight's uh, session so thank you and last but not least dina hi yeah i'm i'm dina nimick um i how did i end up here <laughs> very very quickly thanks to karina um i had never heard about advanced care planning until a couple of weeks ago whenever the team had contacted me uh, in my role as the manager of the Centre for Independent Living's um, independent living team and, and uh, we do a lot of work in supporting people as they prepare their own support plans, uh, mainly in relation to their social care to achieve their, their, their goals in life, amongst a lot of other things. But that's one of the things that, that we do. And I think ultimately I ended up here because I started by explaining my own personal sort of story and perspective and how I think this is such a such a, a great thing for you, you to be doing and a, a fantastic policy for the department to be developing. Great to have all of you. Just to encourage those of you who are joining in um, to connect with the Mentimeter, the code is in the chat function and then there's also the hashtag um, NIL uh, 
L-I-H-L-F-A-C-P, quite gentle, <laughs> but that'll do. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Karina and she'll get us started. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll just, and we'll just start with yourself, Dave, if that's okay. Oh, you? lovely. Yeah. So, uh, Sarah, if you're moving the slides, maybe you could just help me to go on to the next slide which um, just gives an overview of, of what we're, what the next, uh, our time together this evening is going to be trying to look at. So, you know, it, it's, it's all things advanced care planning and why it's, why it's relevant. And then we'll have a look at just um, where to from here in the strategic context for advanced care planning here uh, in Northern Ireland. So if you go then to the next slide, um, Sarah, for me, please. <clears throat> And I, I just want us to, to take a minute just to, 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 to be alert. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things because th that previous slide looked very forward. Um, but advanced care plan, because of the nature of uh, advanced care plan, there can be an emotional impact that comes with that because we are talking about things as you probably gathered from the publicity around this event. We are talking about kind of those core issues of living and dying and what is important to people in relation to those. So for some of us, there may be a personal experience of of very serious ill health currently in our family circle. Um, there could be maybe a, a, a more recent experience of, of grief or bereavement, um, or for ourselves, you know, maybe some of us are, are, are trying to manage a illness. Or, or ill health. So this evening, we will certainly be providing you with with information to stimulate your thinking and hopefully maybe uh, some learning from that. But there will also be an impact on an emotional level for you. And I think particularly as we uh, have the opportunity to listen to Dina talk to us this evening from her experience. So I just want to raise your level of awareness to the fact that it would be really good if you could be mindful of yourselves as we go through this time together uh, and, and when I say that what I mean is um, be alert to any distress in yourself that you're beginning to feel and if you need because you're, you're, you're triggered or touched a, a, in a power way if you need to take a do that and uh, maybe if you can privately alert Sarah or her or one of her colleagues who's supporting this, this session this evening, just alert them to the fact that you're just stepping away for a minute or two to give yourself a wee breather and then when you're able to come back to us. Um, so maybe the session will be, be a wee bit different from what you're used to, but um, I, just to alert you to be mindful of yourself in that. So having scared the life out of you now, uh, we're, we're going to move on together um, into trying to get some kind of understanding of what is this all about anyway. So I think, Sarah, you're going to introduce a, a, a poll for us. Yeah, so if I can encourage all of you to go on to the Mentimeter, you should be able to vote. Um, so what we want to ask you really is what do you feel your current knowledge and awareness is about advanced care planning and I think you can choose an answer from 0 to 10. Is it a foreign concept or do you feel knowledgeable on the topic? I think, I think for me to show you the res results of this, I think I'll absolutely upscale Victoria's presentation. So 
I'll, I'll maybe just wait a wee second and then I'll tell you when everybody's up. We're currently sitting at a 4.9. I have no idea what that means, Sarah. Is that good? Is that good? Are we winning? We'll be winning after, do you? Don't worry. Don't worry. I think I think this will probably work best if this just runs along behind. So I'd encourage all of you to like keep interacting with the Mentimeter in the background. So if we just keep going. Lovely. So I think Karina, you're going to you're going to help us with the as we move to the next slide. Then Sarah, please. If that is yeah, perfect. That's great. Thank you very much. So as Dee has outlined, what we're going to do um, is outline advanced care planning. We're going to look at the what, the why, who, when, and where. And if we move on to the next slide. And I suppose the first thing is really the what. So what is advanced care planning? And as you can see from um, some of the promotional materials, we talk about advanced care planning being an umbrella term and it covers different aspects. So it looks at legal, personal and clinical planning that people might put in place um, to prepare for their future for a time when they're unable to make decisions for, their, for themselves. And I think the important thing to stress is it focuses on what matters to people. So what matters to us now and what would we pair feelings, beliefs and values for our care. Move on. So as we talked about and um, Sarah and the team have come up with this fantastic umbrella um, and as I've said over the next number of sessions we'll be um, today we'll be looking at the wide concept of advanced care planning and some of the policy work um, and then the future sessions will um, look in particular at issues around organ donation, um, other more clinically related and healthcare related decisions such as um, ADRTs, resuscitation decisions, um, and then ultimately we'll come back again at the end of the sessions to um, speak to you all about the advanced care planning policy. So under that umbrella there's lots of topics and for some people they may choose to do different elements at different times. Um, and I suppose that's the important thing to say that um, there's different components and we're just going to take you through some of those now this evening. So if we move on to our next slide. So I think the first thing that we're keen to, to state is the principles of advanced care planning and I suppose these are um, fundamental and core to all of us as individuals and as health and social care um, professionals. I suppose the first thing is to recognise that advanced care planning is voluntary. It's a voluntary pro process, it's very personal to the person and it's about their choices. And we also have to acknowledge whilst we're very keen to encourage advanced care planning, there's some people may choose never to um, have advanced care planning discussions. And so it's what our um, aim is really to offer everyone the opportunity. But as I said, it's their choice if they choose to, um, to have those uh, advanced care pl planning conversations and their choices um, should be respected. I think the third key element is the understanding that people need um, required mental capacity to understand, discuss and make those decisions and to take the relevant actions. And again, these conversations need to be timely and have time and they need to be conducted with sensitivity and compassion because as Dee has outlined, um, these conversations go right to the core, right to our wishes, feelings, beliefs and values and really what matters to us. So by the very nature, we need to feel that we're in a safe and a trusted space and we need to have time um, to have these conversations. And I think one of the concerns people may have about advanced care planning is the phrase, oh, it's written in stone, but that is not the case. Advanced care planning should be an ongoing process of discussions which should be reviewed at particular points that are relevant to the person. Um, and this certainly should be um, revisited over time and people absolutely have the right um, to change their mind. And if we move on to the next slide. So why should we undertake advanced care planning conversations? I think for us, what we find is it, 
and the literature would support that it ensures people to have the opportunity to have timely and realistic and practical discussions um, and take the relevant actions about where and how they would like to be cared for if they lose compa uh, capacity um, to make those decisions for themselves. Um, it gives people peace of mind and as you can see from the quote here that's reflected um, when we met with um, the Older People's Commissioner Eddie Lynch when he said, I think older people would be comforted and have peace of mind following having advanced care planning conversations. And I think we're going to further illustrate the why these conversations are important um, just for our conversation with Dina. So if we can just move to the, to the next slide, please. And um, so if I can just uh, pause here for a moment and properly introduce uh, Dina. Um, Dina, it was great to hear from you at the beginning of, of the session. Um, as Dina had outlined, myself, Deirdre and um, the other members of the project team had the absolute pleasure to meet with Dina as part of an engagement session uh, in her role um, working in the um, I always have to get the name right, the, the Centre for Indep uh, Independent Living. Um, and we were just really struck by uh, Dina's experience and um, um, the time that she'd taken to read the policy and as was reflected on her own experience. We're really delighted to have uh, Dina here today. Um, when I asked Dina to describe herself, she described herself as a um, disabled wife, a mother, a daughter. Um, and is um, a very dedicated uh, person in terms of her role within um, the independent living, um, independent living Northern Ireland. Um, Dina has a son called Sam who is 25 and a daughter called Lydia who is 16. But Dina also had a daughter called uh, Sophia and Sophia would have been celebrating her 21st fourth birthday this May. But sadly, um, Sophia died just after her sixth birthday. And as Dina has outlined to us, this was after battling leukemia for over four years. But Dina um, is very passionate um, in her uh, role as a mother, but also to ensure those um, who need social care assistance have um, the best support to fit in with their lifestyle and their values. And she believes that care and support, support should be very much designed in partnership with all parties being recognized as experts in their own field, with service users and the patients being viewed as trusted experts of their own lives in their own conditions on a daily basis. So being disabled from birth uh, resulted in Dina undergoing um, 20 plus um, major surgeries plus multiple treatments and other therapies over the decades. Her personal experience and the experiences that she's witnessed of other disabled people and other people with complex needs, both young and old, um, throughout her life um, has given her great insight um, into our health and social care system and the values um, that people hold true. This has convinced Dana that the best result within health and social care stems from good listening, planning, creativity, flexibility, honesty, and overall respect for everyone's view. So Dana's team support individuals who need guidance on how to develop their own support plans for um, daily living and to how to achieve their own personal goals. And given her background and work in the field of independent living where choice, control, flexibility are seen as key elements to achieve a good life. Dina and I will share three short stories to tell, tell us all um, where you will hopefully see why she views advanced care planning as essential to achieve the best life for individuals and family, especially when they're facing end of life decisions. So with that introduction, Dina, um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you, thank you, Karina. Uh, um, I'm not sure if, uh, just in terms of uh, the slides and whether we're, whether we're moving forward, so I'll just leave that up to you and your team to move them on as you see fit. Um, I, I also sent a wee video, but I know we've had some 
trouble with with video so um we'll use it if it's there and if it's not don't 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 worry about it um yeah as, as i said um yeah it, I, I i i i sort of i ended up coming to this <laughs> to this event um quite unexpectedly um and my, my, my role as the manager of the independent living team at, at, at Selney, the Centre for Independent Living Northern Ireland, we'll, we'll just call it Selney. Um, I, you know, it was really to do with, with, with the, the role that we play in, in assisting people to uh, organise their own support and, and life to achieve the sort of goals that, that, that they uh, value in life. Um, through all sorts of things, uh, providing advice, directing them around social services, uh, pointing them in the direction of other organisations that, that can help them, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and so whenever I came to the meeting, I have to be honest, uh, Day and, and Karina and folks, I was really surprised whenever I, I thought I was coming to a big event and there was going to be lots of screen, lots of people. And I was really surprised whenever it was just a, the cosy, what, four or five of us. <laughs> so, but in saying that, it was, it was, um, I suppose, it was a good opportunity because um, I, I, I thought what I thought about the policy. Um, you know, what, what influenced my thinking ab about the policy um, and why um, I had, I suppose, certain comments and questions uh, in connection with it. But overall, why I saw it as, as something in incredibly valuable. Um, and yeah, it's not, it's not going to be for everyone, but for some people this. Now, I'm going to tell you three stories. Um, Two in connection with uh, Marine, my rainbow girl there, as you can see her in the in the photograph, and one in relation to my dad because um, the stories connected to Sophia um, really influenced how um, we were making decisions around uh, my dad's health care. Um, there it was before Christmas a year uh, over a year ago. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to maybe follow my train of thought here. Um, another important thing that I mentioned to, to, to Karina this morning in reflection um, about I suppose, where I'm coming from as well uh, is that, that, that I'm a Christian and, um, you know, what, people have different perceptions of what, what, what Christians are and what they believe. Um, but certainly my, my faith um, has been something um, that has heavily influenced my my values, my my thoughts, uh, my hopes, my dreams. Um, but I also, you know, respect and understand um, that that other people have different uh, religions, different beliefs, um, or or maybe don't believe in anything at all. Um, but certainly, uh, mine has influenced my 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 own attitudes towards um, suffering and 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 death as well okay so let's say maybe that, that started to give you a wee, a wee picture of who i am so um yeah again i suppose from a very young age as a disabled person i learned that there was very little that i could do without planning ahead because i had severe mobility difficulties if i'm planning on going anywhere i need to be like um you know and i uh, don't even know what sort of wheelchair i'm going to need to, to bring with me um but uh, as I say, from very, very young, I always needed to know what it was going to be like so I could make decisions about how I was going to manage in those circumstances. So advanced planning has always been part of my life, even when I didn't realise I was doing it as a youngster. Um, so in a sense, moving into the whole independent living movement and um, planning ahead is, is kind of second, second nature to me. Um, and as I say, that's why I say it. I, I, I never really had the, the joy of what is that saying? Sort of living by the city or plants or whatever whatever it is, flying with the city of plants. You know, you could just wing it. I couldn't wing it. I always had to, to have some plans. So anyway, um, the, the um, sorry, my computer is just later. My computer was just about to start running a scan there. That wouldn't have been good timing. Um, so uh, yeah, so with, with Sophia. Without going into too much detail, uh, Sophia was diagnosed with leukemia just before her second birthday. And obviously it was devastating. Um, 
and she had a year's treatment and then we were told her leukemia, oh, sorry, all these distractions, sorry. Then we were told that um, she had actually relapsed and had to start into her, her treatment again. Um, and the second time around, the leukemia had returned in her central nervous system. And the second time around, she started under the treatment, but she got terribly, very, very ill with it. We noticed something was going on. And long story short, she started to have massive uh, seizures and ended up being rushed into the, the Royal. And uh, she needed to be very, very heavily sedated. And she went through an MRI. And basically, we were told that, you know, her immune system was compromised, um, that she had contracted a, a, a type of a virus which had attacked her brain and that she only had um, a matter of hours or maybe a few days to live. Um, we were obviously completely devastated by, by that and of course as Christians we had lots of people praying for her and uh, she, um, with, within about a day or so she started to actually um, show signs of following people around the room with her eyes. And of course, um, some people thought this is wishful thinking of this family. The, the nurses were the first to believe as the doctors were saying, no, we don't think this is happening. Long story short, Sophia did actually recover and was able to go for a bone marrow transplant. She recovered to the stage where she was well enough to go for a bone marrow transplant in, in Bristol. And um, again, I'll not go into the differences maybe in, in, in the cultures within ho the, the hospitals and in different environments. But, you know, whenever you're, someone's going through a bone marrow transplant, you can't afford to go into it um, thinking the worst. You have to go in and think we're going to get through this because there's possibly going to be something great at the other side of it. So it's going to be worth it. And, and that was very much the, the staff didn't mince their words whenever they met us uh, prior to starting the transplant. They told us all the horrible stuff, all the horrible stuff. They got it all out there and they said, well, we're, go we're going to cover this and then we're going to tell you how, the, what the plan is and what we're hoping to achieve. And that's where we're going forward uh, in that hope that this is going to be successful. So, so we, we, we knew all the bad stuff. We were told it, but we were also going forward in the hope that this that, that this might succeed and and, and having hope um, became very much a, a theme for us that there that there has to be hope to get you from one day to the next no matter what you're going through you needed to have a, a glimmer of hope somewhere so anyway Sophia had the the, the transplant uh, came home had a year uh, sorry didn't have a year she, she well she did she had a year um, where she had to be isolated because her immune system was so heavily suppressed and um, eventually was well enough uh, to um, go to, to school. In fact, the wee, the wee photograph there of me uh, sitting with her, which is almost 20 years old, how I've aged, um, it was actually taken um, in a place where we'd celebrated her birthday, where she was allowed to go out and meet with other people, which was, which was fantastic. Um, she was even well enough to, to go to, to school to start P1 um, and um, she had still got the effects of a stroke but that's something that we, 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 could, we could live with. So she'd gone to school then we started into the summer holidays and things were looking great um, and yeah yeah just move on with the slides if, if, as you say as you feel fit. No no, no it's fine there. no it's fine and um, just to let you know we, we, um, we think the video sh should be working now um, off your dad so brilliant brilliant so um, unfortunately though at the end of the summer Sophia had a massive headache so that's back and um, we had um, we were preparing for the worst now obviously advanced care planning in, in this the context of this session is about adults um, but as parents we were having to make the best decision uh, out of love for our, our, our child and we were having to make make plans and make some uh, you know very very difficult decisions so at one point she had actually lost her swallow um, completely and uh, we believed at that point um, we'd, we, we um, from the, the first bout of brain damage she'd had we knew what was involved in putting an NG tube down um, 
so because she lost her swallow, it was, do we put an NG tube down again? And on that occasion, we decided no, no. We would take whatever meds that she needed because she was actually experiencing a great deal of pain, um, just to ease her pain and let her, let her go. We were, we were ready to let her go at that point. Um, however, Sophia, being the girl that she was, um, a few days later, the swallow came back again. And um, again, she was still in a great deal of pain, but um, you know, managing the pain uh, was, was very, very difficult. Um, but having plans as to how the, the pain was going to be managed, so not just today, but if it get worse, gets worse, how we, what the next stage is, always knowing what next we were going to do, having a plan of how we were going to deal with that. Um, uh, was really important. We'd also a young son, Sam was only seven, you know, so again we had to have plans for how we were dealing with him, how we were going to talk to him about things. There was all sorts of things that we always had to keep thinking about. But on that occasion we decided not to put out in the NG tube. However, um, a few months later, um, her the, 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 the leukaemia did a lot more damage to her brain and she suffered massive sort of back-to-back uh, seizures and uh, you know she, she was rushed into the royal and I remember at that time actually uh, in the children's unit um, trying to subtly say to the staff because I was conscious Sophia could still hear is which she probably wouldn't have understood but do not resuscitate we don't want to resuscitate it if she goes she goes we, we're ready we're ready and so we, we were very clear in our minds as a, as a couple uh, you know what we wanted for Sophia um, at that stage it was really important um, and um, it was very very emotional for the staff there I know and the NA as well anyway you know, Sophia survived in, uh, a while longer and was able to go to the children's hospice where she was there for about 10 days before she passed away. But I get, we were faced with this question about the NG tube again. And on that occasion, we changed our mind. We thought, no, she's sedated. Uh, we, you know, she wasn't sedated before, but she was sedated uh, uh, this time. And we thought, no, put the NG tube down. Anything that's going to make her comfortable, doctor. It's what we want her anything that's going to be is uh, make her life as, as gentle uh, um, and as pleasant uh, that's what we want for her um, and on a daily basis we had different doctors that would have called in uh, on on a road to, to the, the hospice over those those 10 days or so and each time we kind of had to explain where we were coming from um, what our values were why we wanted Sophia treated in a certain way but you know every time we were met with respect and, and understanding and that was so 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 important um, and, and in fact um, whenever Sophia had rec recovered the, sorry just to go back to the first time she had the brain damage um, the, there was there was such a mixture of, of responses from consultants but the most helpful ones that we found was one of the younger uh, hematology co consultants was honest enough to say whenever she came around again we don't know what's happened we um, our best guesses and I love that I love that somebody was prepared to say we actually we're not sure what's going on but we think it might be this Ra rather than maybe an older school doctor saying it's this and that and and we're told what it is and that's it you know you take it or, or leave it um, again the the neurologist even came around with the MRI scan showing us this is why I believe this happened so l there's a, the, the humility um, that those doctors showed us um, and um, the, the the fact that they listened was so 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 important um so anyway we're gonna I'll take a wee quick drink here and then we're gonna fast forward quite a number of years to the to the the, the next little story about my dad um i'm not going to show you the video just yet but uh i'll, I'll tell you a wee bit about the, the background to that um okay so so Sophia passed away um, eight days after her, her sixth birthday, which we celebrated in the children's hospice. So fast forward to December, November, December, not last year, but the year before. And uh, I'll introduce you to my, to my wonderful daddy here. He's in his 80s and daddy cares for 
uh, my mum, um, who's in her 80s and who's a wheelchair user, um, just through through old age, you know, she's she's gone off her feet. The two of them sleep in the, the living room on, on separate hospital beds, type hospital beds, and uh, daddy cares for mummy. And he drives and he gets her in and out the back of the wheelchair accessible car and everything. He's one he takes care of all of us and he's in, his, he's in his 80s but daddy had an accident um just over a year and a bit ago and uh with a young rascal of a dog he, he had a he had a child a gate fitted at the bottom of his stairs and um he was he was about to go upstairs carrying far too much probably knowing dad and the stair gate um caught or it actually came off in his hand lost his balance down he went and got a real bad bang on the back of his head so uh, daddy was uh, brought up by ambulance to the hospital and my sister went up with him and uh, not as I said with mum and not long after a few hours later daddy came home he seemed a bit groggy on it but he'd had a rough old evening of it so we thought that's great that the, the hospital has said he's fine so he, he came back and went to bed but the next morning I got another call from my sister Dana dad's definitely not right he's walking about there he doesn't know what he's saying so again we, we ended up back in the royal with daddy and um, he was starting to lose consciousness and we were brought uh, the doctor said look we're going to bring you to this resource area here I think your dad will be more comfortable there and then they showed us down to a family room and I immediately knew because I'd been there before not necessarily early that one but in another family room and I knew what that meant and I said Jim this isn't good I think we need to get the family here so got the family up and true enough uh, we were in and out to dad sort of trying to talk to him and he was he was sort of drifting in and out of consciousness and that and uh, daddy um, family came and the the doctor said look Sorry, so the family came, we were all gathered in the family room and the doctor explained, listen, things aren't good. And they explained how pressure was building up and there was a blockage and it had nowhere to go and that that's what was destroying daddy's brain. That's why he was losing consciousness and he wouldn't have long to go. And would we uh, be willing to have DNR in his file? And um, we all agreed, yes, because we knew that what Daddy was like, and um, we we agreed it was horrendous, obviously for my my mum, and her lady sitting there in her wheelchair having to to take all this in. So we went, and uh, as a family, we gathered around the bed, and uh, family members. Daddy was unconscious by that stage. Family members said their goodbyes to him, and my mum said her goodbye. And it was just so, so heartbreaking, you know, because he was always, uh, he was always my hero. So mum had to go home just for practical reasons, you know, she, she needed to, to, to leave. And um, they said, look, we're going to bring your dad up to the ward uh, now in order to um, make him more comfortable, which I thought that's, that's grand. So we, we went up to the ward and they said, look, you stay in the, the family room in the ward there until we get, get your father sorted. But this day, he'd, he'd been unconscious for quite a number of hours. And uh, so again, the doctor had spoken to his downstairs, um, several doctors had spoken to his downstairs and explained what was going on. Um, and then the, this, the same doctor who had asked about the DNR came and sat down and said, look, I need to talk to you about something else. Um, and um, we, I'll be finishing my shift soon and I need to know, uh, you know, I want to know if I, if I can write up a script for your dad for to, 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 to sort of keep, make him comfortable. And there's some meds, he mentioned the meds and he said, um, it's, it's, but I will tell you that this could bring about his death much quicker. Well, <laughs> my experience with Sophia was, um, was nothing's that definite, okay? Um, I, do, I knew what the drugs would do because I, I understood how they affected Sophia. And when we increased them, that's what happened to her. And I, I, I knew what, was, what, what he was getting at and, and what, what to expect. And um, I said, no, I'm sorry. I don't want you to write them up. Um, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to sleep on this little settee here tonight I'll, I'm, and, I'm, or, and I'm, my sister's going to come up and we're going to spend, sit by dad's bedside and if for any reason we believe daddy gets uncomfortable, 
then we'll give we will we will we will certainly um, sign whatever it's needed for you to give and whatever is required. So he was very very good. He he listened to us and respected that and and left and left us to it. And after a while, we were the the nurse came and got us and said you can go in and see your dad. And uh, when we went in, um, well you'll see the video. I'll see the video, if you can play the wee video now to see what 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 great it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, I'm a shed of water. Give us a wave. <laughs> here, tell us what happened to you. What do you mean? How did you end up in here? What, what, what? How did you end up with a bang on the back of your head? Do you remember? Oh, uh, I see. I was going to go to the stairs. Yes. Yep. You slipped on the stairs. I got to the bottom of the stairs. Yes. I uh, tried to. Can I make a hand with me? Yes. Um, the gate went. The gate went. I tried to hold on to it. Yeah. Oh, that's what it was. And down you went. And down you went. Down you went. Well, I held on to it. Yeah. <laughs> Did the gate come off in your hand, did I? No, I don't think it came off. I saw how the gate had it. I don't remember how. I think it said the gate came off or something off my hand. Well, I know I, I hurt my hand. <laughs> Yeah, hurt on here, like, in yeah. here. Yeah, hurt your elbow. Oh, and there. Maybe careful with it. Maybe careful with it. Put your arm. I know, Daddy, I know. They put something on it. I might have broken it. No, I don't think you've broken it. You haven't broken it. Let me see. Look. Your fishing arm already, Daddy. Which one's your fishing arm? I've got the fishing arm. 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 <laughs> yeah so that's that's jimmy that's my dad and uh yeah i i took the video for a reason though um i was worried that at some point um you know somebody mightn't believe what had actually happened and um because um you know i i thought well I don't want anybody giving him meds during the night because that's not part of the plan. I don't want there to be an accident. I want people to know that daddy's actually recovering here. And in fact, at one point we were taking shifts and sitting with daddy through the night. A nurse did come. Daddy wanted to get up to go to the loo and he was making a bit of a fuss over it in the dock. The nurse said, well, I can give him some meds that'll help sedate him. And my sister was like, no, no tablets, no meds for him, please. You know, give him paracetamol or something, but that's it. Um, you know, so I was I was so glad that we were kind of on guard that 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 night. But you know, Daddy got out of hospital. Oh, sorry, the, the next morning. Um, well, actually, that night uh, the, the doctor came to see him again at the end of his shift, and I have to say he wasn't particularly friendly. And I thought you could at least be rejoicing that Daddy's back and he's he's chatting. You know, and I was I was a bit disappointed in his response. The next day, um, the consultant came round and seen dad and, um, you know, was talking about him and said, well, well, Jim, there's DNR in your file. Do you want the DNR taken off your, oh, absolutely, absolutely take it off, you know, and, uh, you know, and I, I, I said to him, you know, doctor, what happened here? What's happened here? And he says, I don't know. I says, what do we do next? He says, I don't know, because it's a bit of a miracle. I've never seen anything like this before. So I don't know what to tell you and what to expect. I really appreciated that man's, um, again, humility at, at his level um, to have the confidence to say, I don't know. I really, really appreciated that. Um, and, you know, so daddy's now, you know, he's been at home for well over a year, back current for mom, driving, doing all the normal things that he, that, that he does. Um, but because of those experiences that coming back to the advanced care planning um you know i thought it, it's so important that the individual themselves feels as in control of their circumstances as, as they possibly can that their wishes are listened to and respected um and if they can't speak but others who who know and love them really really well that they're 
her views are listened to and respected and written down, um, recorded somewhere, um, so that people know that it's definitely there. Nobody's going to forget anything. It's all it's all in one place. Yes, um, and again, you know, as well as for the individual who's receiving the care to give them maximum control over their own lives, um, the family also have to. I was very conscious. Family you have to live with yourself afterwards. Whenever there are decisions that are made in those circumstances, the, per the, per the people who survive and live on have to live with those decisions for the, the, the rest of their lives. So as much as possible, whenever, the decision, whenever these decisions are being made, the, the respect for the person and what their views were and how they lived and, and how they maybe taught other people to live, um, you know, should, should be taken into consideration. So yes, um, this, I just think this is a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful piece of progress that's been made, with it, made within the department to really highlight it. Um, because poor decisions, rush decisions, um, knee-jerk decisions that are made um, quite often can lead to a great deal of heart, heartache afterwards and that's something that everybody wants to avoid. Tina, do you mind if I ask, um, did you, would you have had any conversations as a family um, prior to that event about sort of what your, your dad would have wanted in that situation? Um, do, do you know what actually, one thing that daddy once said, he, he, mommy was always changing the decor of the house, so he was always up a ladder wallpapering or painting. And he said to me, Do you know, love, the way I'd love to go is I'd love to be hanging a bit of wallpaper and the wallpaper slither down the wall and me slither down with it. What daddy wanted to do was always to be as active as he possibly could until the very end. You know, so the idea of, you know, keeping daddy uh, sort of. Uh, you know, we were very definite about the DNR because we thought, Daddy's such an active, active man. He will not want to, to live if he can't care for mom in the way that he does. So just knowing who, who he was and things like that, the, the way, you know, the, the way he would have talked about his, his life and how he would like to go um, always stuck with us. So I suppose it's about picking up all those wee, wee clues that people maybe may and maybe those are good clues that'll start these difficult conversations as well. Um, sometimes, um, and a lot of the time, I think it can start in humour, and a bit of humour, but then you can start to develop the conversation a wee bit further, um, obviously really gently and, and sensitively, um, very much at the, the, pace, the pace of the person. Um, but what I like about the policy is that it really does capture that very, very well about working at a pace that, 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 that the individual's um, very comfortable with. Sarah, I'm conscious um, and, and Dina that, you know, some people are, are keen uh, to have a few questions or to uh, a couple of participants who have raised their hands. And Dina, I know you have very graciously um, invited people to, to engage with you through either the chat function or the Q&A. Um, I'm just going to check with the participants who have their hands raised. Um, to check with them, would it be all right just to hold their questions just just for a few minutes, even just for a minute or two? Um, and I'm hoping they can indicate that, or else I'll just presume presume their consent in this regard. Because Dima, I I I want us just all of us just to take a minute or two just to honour what you have shared with us in opening a window into your life and into your story. Um, and just to, to thank you sincerely for the gift that that has been to us tonight. Just so grateful to you, Dina. And of course, the other thing, Dina, that I'm really conscious of and tried to alert people to at the beginning of the session was that, you know, for some of us, it may actually have touched 
attached our own stories, our own experiences, um, and certainly would have touched our own hearts. So <clears throat> I, I again just want to invite us to take a minute or two, to take a minute or two, and just to hold that awareness um, that you have brought very much to the fore. And just to check in with ourselves, each of us, to see how we are. Um, and just to be very, very gentle with ourselves if there is any any wee bit of, of distress or um, discomfort in ourselves for that. So just, just to, to honour your, your, what you've shared, Dina, but also to honour ourselves just for a moment and do allow yourselves just to breathe in and breathe out and so together this evening then we're in a position to to incarnate and illustrate Dina some of those qualities you described and found so valuable in the in the the doctors and and the health and social care professionals you met just that that humility and that willingness to listen and and the honesty of saying i am not sure so we can model that for each other this evening just by listening to our own hearts for for a moment or two um so thank you for that <clears throat> I am now going to come back to those two participants who had raised their hands, who maybe had a question for you, Dima, or, or had, had something they wanted, wanted to say. Whether that's available to us now, th those, those inquiries. Yes. Um, just to check with Margaret, you've raised your hand, is that correct? but it's hard to say. Um, just to remind you that this is being recorded, so if, if you do want to speak, which you're more, more than welcome to, um, just to let you know that it is being recorded. Um, otherwise, you can send it into the Q&A box. Um, if you could let us know by the chat function what you would like to do, that would be brilliant. Yes, Margaret, we're aware that you've raised your hand. Okay, what I'm going to suggest then, I'm going to be a wee bit more directive, Sarah, if that's all right, is I'm going to, I'm going to ask Margaret and her, com oh, Margaret is speaking, sorry. Me, me you're talking to. Yes, it's Margaret. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, really, in interesting to hear Dina. I really, really enjoyed her, her stories. And it emphasized to me the difference between uh, when her little girl was ill and then her daddy. I'm a lady of 79 years and my husband, James, died four years ago. Uh, and I experienced a completely different, um, how would you put it, different, different experience than anything that Dina had. Because my husband, unfortunately, was deaf and I have seen his notes and it's written down. Fish doesn't speak, but his wife is all firm. This is someone I knew for 60 years. And he had no hearing aids in the hospital. They lost him. And not a lot of hearing aids are lost in hospitals. And it's never written on the chart. Patient is deaf. And the deaf people, when they get older, smile at you and try and join in the conversation. But they don't actually hear all of the conversation. And because Jim and I were together for over 60 years, he was absolutely in tune with my voice. So we and I sometimes didn't need to say things. We already knew we knew what each other wanted. But Jim went into hospital and we were told he'd be there possibly three weeks. He died in hospital nine months later. And on his desk, he had to his, his attachment on his desk. It was his real thing. I asked if I could have him home. I was told we don't we don't think we could look after him. I, the choice was never there for me. The choice was never there. And I felt really surprised for that because I didn't say goodbye to him after sixty years. And I having to live with that every day. I'm so lonely. 
and it's not there. If you are old and you go to hospital, you don't, you're not fit to stand with young people. You put it like that. But we do have a feeling as well when we get older and we have a brain. It is still working. And if we ask a question, I think we're entitled to control things. We upset that this is caused to my family. I come from a male family. It is unbelievable. My sons are still living with this. It is really heartbreaking. And it was lovely to hear I'm so happy that she's had a beautiful job office. And unfortunately, my husband did as well. And I didn't say goodbye to him. Death is not something I'm afraid of, neither with my husband. Death is a wonderful thing. I came into the earth on my own and I'm going to leave on my own. It's part of the cycle of life. I have no fear of it at all. But it's lovely to say goodbye to someone, especially someone you've been with for 16 years. And I was surprised at that. Margaret, um, I'm not sure, Dave, can you? you I, I just wondered, Margaret, um, I'm just sorry to hear your experience has been so difficult and so painful. Um, and it's definitely something that we will be happy to, to pick up later on this evening or tomorrow if that's okay. Because I think there's, and, and I think you have very positive things to say as well, um, and key messages that we want to hear and make sure that it's incorporated into the work that we're doing. So, would you mind then if we contacted you um, later this evening or tomorrow just to follow up on some of these things that you've raised? Yes, no problem at all. No problem at all. Um, so I'm just going to look to Sarah to make sure that we have um, Margaret's we, details. We will get that okay. That um, if that's okay, Margaret, and then um, we're really just keen to pick that up. And yeah. thank you so much for um, for, for your yeah. um, points yeah. that you've raised this evening. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Uh, for that, Karina and Margaret. Thank you for 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 you know taking the opportunity. Opportunity just just to share your own uh, the pain of your own experience and I am just so sorry that that was your experience. Um, uh, so you know we will look forward to 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 come outside of this forum, Margaret, just so that to see if there's if there's any way that that we can we can be of help uh, to. You. Yeah. And I suppose, <clears throat> as Margaret has has illustrated for us, you know that 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 is the that is the richness of of listening to Dina's personal experience is that it does touch in for all of us for good or ill, whether it was a good experience or a bad experience. So, just very grateful to you, um, Margaret and Dina, for that. And um, what I want to do is, Karina has raised her hand now again. Oh, no, I, I do Do you want no, to say no? Right. She doesn't. Okay, good. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. So uh, the joys of technology. Um, if it's all right for you, uh, and just you know, as I say, as we go forward, Margaret uh, and and all of us this evening, and Dina yourself as well, as we go forward now, um, with the next few slides. Just to please, please be very mindful of yourselves. As you can see and hear, this is a very emotive subject um, that touches into the core of all of us when we're talking about matters of living and dying and grieving. So I am going to ask Sarah, please, to move to the next slide for me. Um, and just to follow up really on what Dina is saying, and, and just to alert you to the fact that D Dina's experience is also available in the research. Um, and in 2018, um, in a systematic narrative review uh, exploring family and carer experience of advanced care planning, Dina, you can go on to the next slide, um, Sarah. These were the responses. Um, there were five key themes that people, uh, family and carers answered in relation to advanced care planning. The first three, I think, touch on what you've said, Dina. 
about the peace of mind that it provides for the person um, for themselves, having taken the time to think about their own advanced care plan, and that even some of the results would have described that it helped people themselves prepare to die. And Margaret was, was saying about, I have no fear of dying. Um, I am ready to die. Um, so there is maybe, a, a, you know, um, thinking about and planning ahead can certainly help us with that. Uh, the second theme then was about just the autonomy that you described as well, Dina, but, but me being in charge of my own decisions and my own, uh, the, the choices I wanted to make in keeping with my values. And that it helped people clarify decisions around what would they want, what would be important to them. And for the person uh, important to them, their family or carers or close friends, it helped them in that it helped ease their concern or any burden they felt around having to make decisions on behalf of the person they loved and cared for. And then thirdly, that it actually, uh, having, having taken the time to think about what matters to me and having taken the time to discuss it with people important to me, that it actually improved the quality of life. Because there was a focus then to say, right, that is for when that time comes. Now let me get on with the business of living my life. And that families actually could enjoy um, time together because that had been cleared as it were and those some of those decisions had been discussed and had been made. The other piece and Dina I think you you illustrated this for us too about you know the timing of it when is the right time to introduce these kind of conversations and it is very much um determined by the readiness of the person. We will we will talk a wee bit more later on about, about some of the prompts maybe to help us, but the timing is very individual to the person and just to be alert with this. And I suppose what is very useful for us, the rest of us who, who are, are um, present tonight, is that that, those, um, that system, systematic narrative review, the research described, according to family and carers, that a lot of health and social care professionals had a very poor awareness or knowledge of advanced care planning. And where they did know something about it, um, they felt themselves that they lacked the confidence in broaching these, these um, issues with people for fear of causing distress for fear of causing distress. So that's why it's wonderful this evening in the forum that um, the next generation um, of health and social care professionals and clinicians are tuning into this really important um, type of, of planning ahead at such an early stage in their career. So thank you for that. Um, I am, Sarah, you can tick, hit the next slide for us, please. And I'm going to hand back over to, to Karina. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Dee. So the next question really is, who should um, you know, go through the process of advanced care planning? And I suppose the easy answer is all of us. Um, it's important to us all, irrespective of age, whether we have a condition or an illness or not. Um, and as Dina had mentioned, the work that we're progressing, the draft advanced care plan policy is for those adults aged, aged 18 years and over. And so that will be inclusive um, of all adults. Um, I suppose none of us can be sure if we'll always be able to make our decisions for ourselves. And again, when we listen to, to Dina talking about Jim's story, that's a really classic example of how going out and about in your daily business that, um, you know, something can happen um, that makes you unable to, to make those decisions for yourself. For yourself. So again, all of us should plan um, and look at having those advanced care planning conversations. I suppose the phrase that um, we would use is hope for the best, but reinforcing that we need to sometimes think about and plan for the worst. Thanks, Sarah, for moving on to the next slide. And so if all of us should do it, when should we have these conversations? When's the right time? And I think 
the key message of the policy that each one of us should think of it now. Um, there should be no necessarily barriers to that. But there are particular people um, or there's particular situations where it's really particular, uh, it's um, important um, and there might be triggers for prompting some of these advanced care planning conversations. First of all, we need to make sure, and Dana has talked about earlier on the clues, and that's what we talk about, the clues or the cues in advanced care planning. Those, those um, we throw away conversations that people might raise. Um, one of the ones Dee uses that she's heard in her practices, of only, I only need two more clean shirts, or I'm nearly done, or, um, oh, sure, I don't think I'll see the summertime. And it's all of those things where people are trying to, to get us to maybe um, have those advanced care conversations. So I suppose that's part of our work is, is to raise awareness uh, of, of those types of cues. So when the person's ready, um, often within health and social care system, it fits very neatly sometimes to start conversations at a point of a diagnosis. But again, sometimes that can be a very challenging time for people and they need a time to adjust to the diagnosis. Um, so there can be challenges having some of those conversations just around points of diagnosis. Um, but at certain points of holistic assessment, advanced care planning topics might come up in conversation. And again, there may be people who um, we may know that, um, for example, in diagnosis, diagnosis of dementia, where people may um, be getting to lose capacity. So those are some of the cues of when we should think about advanced care planning in particular from a health and social care perspective. We just move on to the next slide. So where should advanced care planning conversations happen? And I suppose what we have had reinforced throughout the engagement on the policy work that I will talk about shortly is that health and social care system is very, very important. And these conversations may have started within health and social care and particularly within palliative care. But we need to bring these conversation into everyone's homes and our communities um, and right across all care settings. Um, and we need to um, uncouple it from that idea that this is just a, a conversation for those with palliative and end of life care needs. It's a conversation for all of us, as I said, in places where we're most comfortable, which tends to be our homes and our communities. And we just move on to the next slide. And linking to when and 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 who, we're just going to play this short video, um, and I think it reinforces um, that point that all of us should think about planning ahead uh, right now. Uh, and the theme of this video is none of us really knows when our last a thousand days will be. So thank you very much to the technical team who have got this working against all odds. The day's almost over. The sky is about to show her. First glimpse of gold over waking up dreams and thing is I don't know why things that I felt so concerned with just let go and drift with the breeze. I've been running around looking for answers and all of these days there still ain't enough. Like the moonlit night planes that the questions just hang all I need is time with your love. I've been running around looking for answers And all of these days there still ain't enough There ain't enough Time with you Back to you, Dave, thank to your you. Yeah, thank you, Karina. And 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 again, um, my goodness, this is, this evening is uh, a wee bit of a roller coaster for us. Um, so again, just to invite you to to be aware of any impact from that. That that is a fairly stark uh, video in the sense of you know when you see those numbers between people of all age groups. So. 
again, just encourage you to check in with yourself, see how you're doing. Um, are you fit to stay with us for just for another short while this evening? Um, have you had your quota for this evening? Um, do you just need a wee break? And, and really to encourage you um, to do what you need to do in relation to this work this evening. Um, very, very gently. For those of you who are able to stay with us and are able for another few slides um, as, as we, we wind our way onward on this, this kind of roller coaster this evening uh, from head to heart, to head to heart, to head to heart. Um, for those of you who are able to stay with us, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. So take a few deep breaths, put your feet on the ground, hold your hand to your tender heart, and we'll try maybe just stepping nice and gently onward for these, these remaining slides. Sarah, please. I think it's, I think it's really interesting how it, it becomes so much more than a policy when you actually think about it. Like everybody has experiences, personal experiences of of end end of life care, and it's not even just end of life care. It's it's things that happen unexpectedly throughout our life, and we don't know what the future holds in any way. Like that video of a thousand days, that's just one aspect of it. So I think it's really important to remember that there's a personal aspect to it, and that's what this policy is trying to capture and everybody's personal experiences and how we can make decisions based on what everybody, what everybody's choices are. Yeah, yeah. And, and thank you, Sarah. Thank you for that, that reflection. I, and, and it's also important, I think, and I want to just go back to, to something that Dina said, and again, it was reiterated in the, in the, um, in the research, is that, you know, for, for any of us just to take that pause and consider our own mortality, you know, and, and then maybe have a conversation with people we care about or people who are important to us or, and, and maybe begin to write a plan. Once we have done that, then our focus is very much on living. So it's not a case of us having to start going through our lives with our nail, our knuckles trailing off the ground, you know, with any kind of morbid fascination that, oh, I'm not long for this word. But, you know, it, it's about making provision, as, D, as Dina said. Her life has been um, based on planning, planning how, where, when, you know, and, and to support that. So for all of us, uh, Sarah, that reflection is, val is welcome and necessary. But then we get on with living. Then we get on with living our lives. So with that note uh, and encouragement, I hope, Karina, I'm going to hand back over to you. Thanks very much, Steve. I suppose the, the, the last part of the evening is really taking what we've heard today in terms of what advanced care planning is, why it's important, when should it start, and to share with you some sort of pragmatic steps and trying to make that a possibility for all of us um, in Northern Ireland. So within the Department of Health, the Minister for Health has signed off and approved the development of an advanced care planning policy for Northern Ireland. And um, so that's what we are, are currently progressing. So there's four objectives in the work and you've heard us mention the policy. So that subject we, we met, um, I'm delighted to have met Dana through engagement, we have um, developed a first draft and um, shared that with wide stakeholders. So with um, members from different organisations, with um, community and voluntary sector organisations, with academics, with educators, with regulators, with people from um, the deaf community, people from um, RNIB. So try to get a real good breadth of engagement right across uh, Northern Ireland to, and I suppose wider than that, as well actually to understand um, how can we make this um, policy as robust as possible. So we have um, developed that first draft and um, what we are currently doing is revising that based on the engagement that we've had to date. Um, 
and I know in later slides we'll mention, we're really keen to have an engagement session with yourselves and with other uh, members who want to join one of um, a forum later on in the year, on the 7th of, of April, um, to share that second draft of the policy and, and to have a, a, a particular engagement session on it. Um, and then the policy after that phase will go to public consultation. So that's really our first objective, get a really robust policy, um, a public facing policy for, for um, all our, our people who, who live right across Northern Ireland. The second objective then is we need to take the policy and develop um, clear guidance for health and social care staff and also public information about advanced care planning um, so that we can distill all the principles and values within the policy into something tangible and something that we can implement um, at grassroots level and at individual level right across um, Northern Ireland and within our health and social care system. So that's objective two. And if we just move to objective three in the next slide. So I think events like this and other events will plan will help us to develop clear and consistent messaging about advanced care planning and some of the myths and misconceptions that there are around different elements under that umbrella of advanced care planning. Um, because what we want to do is ensure that there's correct information and it's standardised and it's um, right across the health and social care system. Um, and we want to make sure the practice is standardised as well um, so that um, the experience that Dina has shared um, and that Margaret shared, hopefully there will not be such a, a void and a difference going forward that um, there will be good practice right across um, our, our health and social care services and within our communities. And so that takes us on then to the last objective was around training and education. Um, and I think that's been mentioned earlier on. So we need to make sure that staff, Dee had mentioned it earlier, we need to make sure that um, staff feel confident and competent to have these um, complex conversations um, and to have the skills that, that the Dean has outlined in terms of um, that ability to listen, that humility and be able to um, understand that um, things change, we don't know all the answers, but how to uh, manage those conversations sensitively and compassionately. Um, so that's the fourth objective then of the work that we're doing in terms of looking at the training and education. And again, it's wider than our health and social care trusts. It's looking at GPs, hospices, community and voluntary sector organisations, and really anywhere where people will be having these types of advanced care planning conversations. and supporting people to have those advanced care planning conversations. And Dee and myself and Karen, Michelle, Craig and, and Seika are working on at the minute. A, a small but uh, beautifully formed team that, that um, are, are working well together. So that's our four objectives uh, for the policy work. So we'll move on then just to the next slide. It's really just what I've mentioned. Where are we going to... What, what are we going to do from here? So we'll re we're currently revising phase two engagement sessions and as part of that engagement we'd really be keen for um, everyone on this evening to, to join us again on the 2nd or the 7th of April uh, and maybe bring a few friends as well um, along with you so that we can have a proper engagement session on the next draft of the policy um, because that will really shape how advanced care planning will be implemented and rolled out across Northern Ireland. So, so that's here, or where we are too from here, actually. That's better. And then the next guess, slide, Sarah, guess, is... I'm just gonna guess, ask you guess who? Guess who? <laughs> Every time you see that rose and, and the hands, you know, you're saying, oh, it's your woman again. Mother of sorrows. <laughs> it's the mother of sorrows again. Um, <laughs> just while, while uh, we're holding this slide, um, I know that in the background, Sarah and her... her her fabulous colleagues have set up another a uh, interactive piece which is i think the word cloud this time sarah um and it's it's where you're you're been invited just to you know if there's anything you learned um can i just alert you in this trigger alert that you see if any if you say you learned nothing you are so far um so <laughs> really <laughs> see see let's see um 
So Sarah is going to, to, to let us get a look then at what this word cloud looks like when you have inputted your words. It's, it's not a word cloud just yet. This is like a wee, just like a wee 250 character kind of what you've maybe picked up, something you want to highlight or, or say, and then we'll move on to the word cloud. Oh, brilliant. I know it, it's a work in progress, Sarah. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just trying to apply a wee bit of pressure uh, to you. That's all, yeah, you know, just yeah. because because you've been kind of, you know, just uh, riding along there for a while. So <clears throat> really looking forward to seeing this, what this uh, word cloud comes up with. And then I, w w when we get a look at this, I will be happy to come back to that, that uh, holding slide again. <laughs> this is all very exciting, isn't it, to see these words come up? Yeah. Is this what, Sarah, just forgive, forgive me, is this what people are typing in? Are they inputting those things? Or... Yes, yes. So if you if you go on to menti.com and type in the number that's in, it should be in the chat multiple times, um, then you have an opportunity to say what what your thoughts are and comment. It just, just makes it a bit more interactive, which is good. Oh, that is so good. It's, it's hard to kind of present both presentations at the same time and it all yes. gets a bit confusing yeah. but we'll iron out the iron out all of that for next time no this this is i, I i'm just reading and can i just thank people who are because the patient driven not doctor yeah i'm just reading some of these fabulous um responses that it, mat yeah. it matters to those left behind difficult conversations can be made easier with the right skills, and I think Dina was a was a terrific, a terrific um, advocate for that, or uh, and illustration of that in her in her sharing. Mm -hmm. Unique to the individual, absolutely. How important is relevant to all of us? Not associated with the end stages of life. It's about living purely. Isn't that fabulous, Dina? See, you know, they're living secure. Eight. Oh, they bring good. I think I think everyone has this fear about talking about these sorts of things because they think that means it's going to happen. Actually, I I think my perspective on advanced care plans it's not just about putting a sticker on it. It's actually so so much more than that and so relevant and it just empowers patient choice even when they maybe don't have capacity anymore but it's still their choice and they've maintained that throughout their life. Oh wow, that, that is fabulous. <laughs> and be sure and type that in there because that needs to appear in the word cloud if that is the outcome for you of this evening. Um, that is open this work, Karen and and Michelle and, and Corinne and Dina, indeed. We'll, we will be sitting smiling to ourselves saying, well, my goodness. If, if, if the, oh, this is, just, this is just fabulous. While that is all happening uh, in, in front of our very eyes, the other thing I wanted to come back to because I put a pause on it uh, partway through um, this evening, was a questions. I'm conscious that there was another participant had her hand up um, and who wanted maybe to ask a question, uh, but to engage with Dina in some way. So can, if that participant is still with us and if he or she would still like to either ask their question, and if they would post that or please raise your hand, ask in Q&A, or you see, and the word becomes flat before our very eyes. So please do feel free, because I don't want anyone going away from here. Scope that, ask their question. So please, please do take your opportunity there. <clears throat> This takes a wee while to build, Sarah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, so I'm actually going to move on to the next one. So st still keep keep inputting, but I think, I can't remember what the next slide is, to be honest, but we'll have a look. No, don't. Right, 
pretty well just there the uh, the mother is sorrows here at the at the outset uh, of our, our session this evening i mentioned to you just w when i introduced the trigger alert and i just mentioned to you to 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 be very gentle with with yourselves as we went through this evening because the content and um just the experience of this evening is maybe a bit different from what 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 people, particularly people who are in education, maybe it's a wee bit different from what you you would be used to. So I want to I want to come back to that again now as we move to the end of our time together. Um, and I I just want to say to you again, first of all, to those of you who were a day with it, until um, sorry, I'm a wee bit distracted. Let me decide, Professor D. William Malloy. Is that the word cloud? Oh, sorry. Yes, we moved on to the word cloud. I was just doing that in the background. Sorry to have distracted you. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just reading. Let, let me decide, Professor D. William Malloy. That's not the outcome of all those fabulous inputs there, is it? No, no, this is a new one. So this, is the next qu this is the next question. <laughs> so what, what words do you associate with advanced care planning? <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay. Can we hide that again just for a minute, uh, Sarah? Because th th this is this is this this wee bit is important as well. Yeah. Just just for a minute. Um, so going back to that triggering piece and saying that as we we move toward the end now, is is we're able to stay, that when we finish together. Please do go very gently this evening because there is still within us the impact of what we have listened to and what we have shared from both Margaret, who, who joined us, and uh, of course from, from Dina, who, who was with us from the beginning. So just to be mindful that that can, that can stay around with us for a wee while. So, you know, after we finish and you go about the rest of your evening, just very, very gently, um, do something really restful for yourselves. Um, nothing too taxing, I would say. And um, if there are those of you who are students, if there are professors or academics waiting on assignments, tell them I said no, not this evening. So no homework for this evening. So let me just check. There does seem to be a question in the chat. Dina, this is for you. Dina, did you experience with your daughter make you feel more empowered to make decisions about your daddy? It did actually. It did um, because I, I suppose I had. Well, I didn't understand the 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 procedures as a medical student or as a nurse. Um, I understood what certain things meant and actually that's another thing about um, having these conversations whenever we're talking about support planning we're talking about empowering people but also the other thing that empowers people is is good good information good relevant information because information means power so whenever you can understand something better um, you're, ob you're obviously in a much better position to make an informed decision about it. So, yeah, it, it, it's about, I suppose, making sure that people have the, the, an, uh, a right, the, the right amount of information. And our experience with Sophia going through, you know, losing her and then not losing her and then losing her. Um, you know, we, we, we'd lived through a lot of that. And I suppose um, in the, the children's cancer ward and while we were from Bristol, we also, you know, got to some families who, who lost their, um, their, their, their wee ones and, and how they were dealing with it as well. So I kind of had a lot in my head. So whenever it came to daddy, a lot of stuff I'd already kind of thought through because it, we lived with it for so long. Um, um, you know, I, I suppose one of the things that we, whenever we were talking, uh, whenever we had our meeting the other week, um, uh, day, day, and and um, Karina and all we, you know, one thing that struck me was um, 
I suppose I had learned to live in an environment where death was a reality. Um, and not, but not as a medical person, but you know, within a fa within through the family, like the, the family that was the hematology unit in the Royal, you know, those were very uh, real conversations that you had on a daily basis. And I suppose, um, you know, that's not where most people's minds live. <laughs> in reality, you know, thank God, most people don't have to live with that um, on a, on a day to day basis, but. On the other hand, it is a reality, and I think it is it is way to think about it, um, and um, to because in our society we don't really talk about it enough. Um, we kind of think we're invincible, and that it's never going to happen. You know what I learned was life can turn on a penny. You know you you have your sense day. You know, but I I was like life can turn on a penny. Things can happen really really suddenly. You know, so in a sense, having these conversations, taking an interest and in, and in learning a bit more, um, being able to make informed decisions, those are really, really good things. That they're life enhancing things. They're not about misery. You know, um, it is about control and and living your best life and making the plans, uh, the, the the best plans that you can. Brilliant. Do you know what a champion for advanced care planning? Um, and I can assure attendees, no money has been passed uh, to Dina prior, during, or nor will it be after this event for, for all the positive things she's saying about, about this policy development. I don't see any other Q&A then in the question. So Sarah, we're ready for the big reveal of the first word cloud, which is, is this what people have learned, Sarah? <laughs> Oh. No, it is. It is. Yeah, it's kind of like a thought. So we we initially did a word cloud at the start. What sort of words do you associate advanced care planning with? Like I can potentially go back to that one, and we can compare. But you'll have to bear with me. No, this is lovely. No, no, please, Sarah. This is lovely because this is what words do people associate with advanced care planning? Yeah. And just look at that, Dina. Do you see all just what you've just said? Remember humor, fabulous. Holistic conversations, process. It's actually interesting to go back to the silver cloud. I know maybe not as many of you would have. Oh, you mean at the very beginning? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. this would be good. Yeah, let's have a look. Let's see. Where is it? Here we go. Oh, look at that. So it's, it's very different, actually. There's a couple of beauties in there, though. Do you see that? The, the holistic, dignified contentment mm -hmm. process, funeral. Yeah, that's a mixed bag, isn't it, at the, at the outset, Sarah? And then can we just flick to the, to the end one again, just yes. to see this? Oh, we've reached the end. Wow, look at that. I wonder, is it possible for us to capture that 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 picture in some way, just Sarah, for our, uh, when we go on the road again? Yeah, no, I've got that all, all saved. I'm doing that in the yeah. background. So, I just wondered, did everybody to, get a chance to see all the answers tonight um, to all the other questions and polls, if we had time, just in conclusion? Yeah, we... Can you go through it? Yeah. Um, let me just see. What can you do in the minute? The word cloud. I, I can the see the word, 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 word cloud. But it's maybe just me. You know, when you have, um, well, I put it tonight, but when you've input it, you're just curious to see what the overall is. No, absolutely. I think it is good to go through. Right. Okay. So, oh, there we are at the start. Um. So we asked you all at the start, what sort of level of knowledge do you think you have about advanced care planning? And we're sitting at a 5.6. We didn't actually repeat that question, but I think it'd be too difficult for me to go back and add that in at the minute. <laughs> um, your initial perception, do you think it's relevant to you? A couple of people weren't sure. Some people said no. Who do you think it is relevant to? You? I, think, I think this is a really interesting question because if you look at the category options, I think 
I think before I started kind of looking into the advanced care planning, I knew myself, I thought, okay, maybe it's people who are that wee bit older who kind of probably are going to die sooner than maybe somebody who's younger, maybe somebody who has a long-term health condition, things like that. Um, people who engage in risky behaviour, jumping off buildings, whatnot, like, is it really relevant to me? But actually, it's relevant to all of us because, as we've quite clearly said, like, who knows what, what the future holds? And it is just about empowering choice, and that's the really exciting thing. And that's what's really exciting about the policy, I find, anyway. Great. Okay, I think there are mixed experiences with advanced care planning. Lots of people said no. I can maybe stop it, hold on. So that's great that there's people are, are coming to our knees, so that's really good. Mm -hmm. Help people um, join us as they And then, what was it? And what have we learned? So I think that's kind of gone through everything Twitter and stuff like that. Um, uh, that is brilliant. So finally then, just before I hand over to Karina Grimes, just to, to, to uh, last, 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 just again to remind us all, nice and gentle this evening um, for all of us. Uh, that, that was a fairly uh, powerful session because of, of I think, the, the, the power of a personal story, Dina, is just so rich. Um, and it touches us and it can stay with us and Margaret's Margaret's um, personal experience as well. It's just so painful. So gently, gently for the rest of us this evening and uh, gently, gently to Sarah and your industrious team there behind the scenes who were going pale mail uh, from 20 to, when we, when we met you, from 20 to 7 until 7 o'clock and then it all calm face, well done you thank you for that so over to you Karina then just to just to close yes and I and I don't want to hold up anyone um any longer this evening because as Dee said we all need to go and get that cup of tea and um go gently with ourselves but I want to really thank the uh NI Health Care Leadership Forum and um, Sarah has been so helpful over this uh, sh short but very productive period um, and it's been great to meet uh, Eve and chat with Emma as well. So um, thank you very much for um, having the vision and the leadership Chan, people sometimes unfortunately shy away from. So um, I think the future is bright in terms of health and social care. And um, when we look at um, the, um, the caliber and the, the vision of the, the four members coming forward, um, so really just wanted to say thank you. I want to just outline to people too that this is one of five in the series and I know Sarah might want to mention um, the next series um, and again just to make a plug for ourselves for the 7th of April time it would be really great to have you back to have your views in terms of, of that policy and again you'll get a copy of the draft policy in advance and um, we'll go through an engagement session um, just to, clean to, to get people's views. So um, Thank you very much, everyone. And I'm just going to pass over to Sarah. Thank you for your time. I just wanted to say you contributed to tonight. It was really exciting um, to see all the work that's going into this upcoming policy. And of course, the most exciting part is that this is not the only night. There are five others ending with the one that was mentioned on the 7th of April. So that, that sort of evening will probably be a wee bit more informal. I know it's a bit restrictive and that you can't really see everyone else, but we'll work something out and make sure it's nice and interactive and you can contribute to what you think the policies should include and how we can better facilitate patient choice throughout their life. So um, I'm just going to share my screen one more time. Honestly, I've got that many tabs open. I have to find out where it is. Let's see. Just when you were very remiss of me not to sincerely taking the time to share your experience, and again, you've done it so graciously and without any um, bother. So, thank you very much, Dina.
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the next session will be next Thursday, the 18th of March, uh, looking at the, the multidisciplinary approach to palliation. So that's really exciting. And then we'll explore some of the other aspects of advanced care planning. As we've seen, it's an umbrella term and it incorporates a lot of things. Um, but we hope to see you on some of our other nights too. Uh, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to email um, healthcareleaders at qb.ac.uk. But I'll be honest, there's been some problems with the Queen's email and trust email. So maybe use your personal one if that's, if that's the case. Have a go and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>